All right, welcome to week four, actually. Am I reporting? Yes, I am. Okay, <laughs> welcome to week four. So we'll be taking you through a clinical overview of the upper limb. So this is like the actual important stuff that you should probably know. Sensory processing, neural integration, and like the MSK exam. So Malika will be taking you through that. Okay, so, so the overview of what we're gonna be talking about today in terms of upper limb clinical stuff. So we're gonna talk about brachial plexus injuries, fractures of the upper limb, dislocations, inflammation, and other stuff. Um, so this will just be how I'm going to structure the presentation. And I think you guys had a revision lecture recently as well. So maybe this will kind of link in with what you've already learned. Okay, so you can have damage to like the very root of your brachial plexus. So this is like really far up before it's like become anything else. So if you damage, so Herb's palsy is when you damage like the upper roots. So C5 and C6, I think it's more commonly C5. And if you think about like the way the brachial plexus is structured in the neck, if you increase that angle between your neck and shoulder, you're going to be pulling on C5 or C6 because it is like higher up there. And because C5 and C6 contribute to a number of different nerves in the arm, you end up with weakened shoulder abduction, flexion, and your arm hangs by your side. There's medial rotation of the arm, and it's like your forearm pronated, you have a flexed wrist. And this is just because of like the loss of C5 and C6 and the nerves that it contributes to. So this like this presentation is classically known as like waiter's tip because it's like the, um, oh, give me one second, I'll answer that. Um, so, waiter's tip is just when you're, oh, I can't have to get up. <laughs> it's like, you're like asking for a tip because your arm is like turned back and your hand is like that way. So it's like the waiter's walking away and they're like asking for a tip by like having their hand out. Um, medial rotation is basically, so because your medial side is like the side facing inside, if you like rotate your arm medially, it would be like, kind of like a, like a whip. <laughs> It's essentially a whip because you're, yeah, you're rotating your arm medially. You've got that medial side and you're rotating in that direction. I hope that sort of helps. <laughs> okay, Klumke's palsy is damage to like the, the lower roots of your brachial plexus. So that would be C8 and T1, which are like the last two in your brachial plexus. And this one's a component of the ulnar radial immediate nerves. So it has contributions to these particular nerves. Um, and if you think about where it is in the arm again, if you want to damage this, then I mean, you don't want to damage it, but if you were to damage it, it would be because you have your arm like super abducted and that pulls against like the, the roots at the bottom. Or you can have like a tumor that's pressing against it. So that leads to weakened intrinsic hand muscles and loss of medial arm sensation just because you're losing um, like, the like the nerves that have these as a contributor. And it presents as like a claw hand. So one of the things that you can sort of do to try to remember it is that Klumpke has like an O in it. So it's like lower root damage. And so I think the classic like scenarios I give you for herbs palsy, herbs palsy is the one where it's like, there's a baby being born and they like, as they're being born, their like angle between the neck and shoulder is like super big. So then they have this like floppy arm, like what's, what's wrong with the baby? And you're like, oh, it's herbs palsy because it's the baby thing. And then Clumkeys is like, oh, this person's falling from a really high place and they reach out and like try to um, break their fall by grabbing like a tree branch. And that leads to like really big abduction. And then you can kind of be like, oh yeah, that's that Clumkey's palsy. Okay, so those are like the root injuries. Now we're gonna go on to like the branch injuries. So these are like your like five like branches. So first one is musculocutaneous. So I'll also kind of be talking about like where it innervates in terms of movement and sensation, just so that you can kind of correlate it with the clinical stuff. So your musculocutaneous nerve is the one that runs anteriorly in the arm and then it moves laterally as it goes down the forearm. So if you lose this one, then you lose all of the stuff that innervates in like the in the arm anterior region. So that means that you lose your ability to flex your elbow because that's what happens when this muscle shortens. And you've also lost sensation in your arm and lateral forearm because that's the cutaneous part of the muscular cutaneous nerve, which is very conveniently named because you've got the musculo, which is like elbow flexion, and then cutaneous, which is lateral forearm sensation. So next one is axillary nerve. I've also just put like a diagram of like approximately where the nerve runs um, on the side. Just like, I found that that really helped me learn this because you can picture like where it goes in the arm and figure out like what structures that it innervates and therefore what would happen if you lost that. So axillary nerve, um, that this is the one that kind of like wraps around your humerus, like pretty close to like the shoulder region. And it provides sensation to like the regimental patch, which is, I think is like technically where like the patch goes if you're like in the army. Um, and it also provides like innervation to the deltoid and teres minor, which are which need are needed for abduction from 15 to 90 degrees. So they can initiate that abduction movement, but they can't go further than that. 
Um, so one of the key words that you want to look out for with axillary nerve injury is that they have injury to the surgical neck of the humerus, which is where this nerve like runs really close to. And you can kind of see it here as well. So that surgical neck is there and you've got your axillary branch, which is running really close to it. Okay, next one, median nerve. This one's got a fair bit of stuff to, to know. So this one runs down your arm, doesn't do anything pretty much until like the forearm region. And then it does a lot of stuff in the hand. So it, as it runs medially in the forearm, it goes, it goes more laterally in the hand to innervate like the thumb and like the first two fingers. So sensation wise, if you lost your medium, median nerve, you would end up with um, the lateral 3.5 fingers. So the thumb side, you wouldn't be able to feel this as well. And loss of movement, you've got wrist flexion, lateral finger, carpophalangeal flexion, interphalangeal extension. So these two are from the lumbricals. And we kind of talked about this last time. And um, there was a really handy way of remembering what the lumbricals do with like, the diamond shape. So it flexes at this joint and extends at this joint. Diamond. OK. And then the inner eminence muscles. So that's just the, like, the thumb muscles here. Um, so a way to remember that is thenar, thumb, so th and th. So thenar was always, will always be referred to your thumb side on the lateral side. And hypothenar is the one that refers to like the pinky side. Um, in terms of remembering what it innervates within the hand itself, because there's like so much random shit in the hand, um, you can remember that it innervates the loaf muscles, so lateral lumbricals. So that's like just because you've got like four lumbricals or I don't know, a certain number of lumbricals, but you, they do a lateral, they do a lateral few. You've got opponent's pollicis, abductor pollicis, and flexor pollicis, which it did pollicis just means like thumb. So it just does a bunch of stuff in the thumb. Okay, so when you injure the median nerve distally and proximally, I think it presents in slightly different ways. So carpal tunnel syndrome is one that you sh should know, and I think it comes up a few times in terms of clinical skills as well. So with median nerve um, distal lesion, so that's distal means it's like further away from like the body. So that would be like closer to like your hand region. Um, and when you have carpal tunnel syndrome, it can be caused by like tendonitis of the flexor retinaculum, which is a thing that overlies the carpal tunnel, or you can have a lunate dislocation, which I think is one of the floors of the carpal tunnel. So if you fell, the foosh injury is just when you fall on your outstretched hand, so literally just like the shorted way of saying that. And if you fall on that, you can dislocate your lunate, which would then push forward and perhaps irritate your median nerve. And once you've damaged that, you can affect the thinner eminence, which is where it supplies um, after it leaves like the flexor retinaculum area. And then you would get all the effects of that area. So you would have like a really like atrophied thinner eminence. You'd have like weird tingling sensations, numbness. And that's like what's classically associated with carpal tunnel as well. Okay, so mean and nerve proximal lesion. So this is a lesion that's like closer to like the main body area. So let's say you fractured like your humerus and you managed to damage your median nerve. So you end up with the hand of benediction, which is like this sign that we put down here. And it's basically where you ask the patient to make a fist. So you have them ha open their hand up, you make a fist, and they can't do it because they've damaged like the nerve supplying these three fingers. So they've just, they can only do that. And it looks a lot, it looks quite similar to one of the other tests later on, but we'll like tell you like what the difference is. Okay. So radial nerve. So this one runs down like the back of the arm and it comes down like all the way to the forearm and it goes to the hand as well. So you lose sensation to the posterior arm and forearm and then it does some stuff in the hand. So you lose that sensation as well. And this one does a fair bit in terms of motor as well because you innovate all the motor muscles in the back of the arm and the forearm. So then you would lose your ability to extend your elbow and your wrist. Um, and it runs really close to the humerus within the radial groove. So it means that if you've got like a fracture of like the humerus, you could damage that. And the, the, like, the classic sign associated with radial nerve damage is like wrist drop because you've got elbow and wrist extension that, um, that, you, can no longer, that you can no longer do. So if, you, if, it, if the radial nerve helps with like extending your wrist, um, once you can't do that anymore, it flops forward. So then that you end up with wrist drop. And so this is something that can be caused by Saturday Night Palsy, which is something I think they like to talk about. But it's basically you compress the nerve in the axilla. So you don't like break any bones, but you just compress it um, by putting pressure on it. And that can present with wrist drop. Okay, on the nerve. I think this is the last. Hmm, I don't know. It might be the last of the branches. So the ulnar nerve runs um, like medially within the arm. And it does like the, the medial fingers as well. So you're like pinky and like your ring finger. So the lost sensation would here would be to the 
to these particular fingers and you would lose the motor effects to like the wrist flexion on the medial side, your like hypothenar eminence, so all your pinky stuff and your lumbricals on that side. And then this one controls all of your interosse, which are for finger abduction and adduction. So that's like this movement. Okay, so if you had proximal damage, so that's closer to the, to the main body, that would lead to like on the claw hand. So this one looks a lot like your hand of benediction, except for the fact that it's, you're asking the patient to open their hand instead of close their hand. So they have their hand closed. And when you ask them to open their hand, it looks like this. So like appearance wise looks a lot like the hand of benediction. But the difference here is that the patient can do whatever they want with their thumb. Whereas with the hand of benediction, the patient can't do anything with the thumb, which is why it's stuck in this open position. Okay, and then you've got distal damage as well. So let's say you had like a hook of hamate fracture or like the Guyton's canal compression. So the, the ulnar nerve runs really close to that as it goes to like the, goes towards like the pinky. So you would end up with clawing, but you wouldn't have any changes of the ability to, of the fingers to flex because um, that's, that's the point of damage. Like they've already gone and innervated like the things that help you flex and it's just the clawing that will be affected. Okay, so hand innervation. So this is kind of hard to remember just because it's like kind of weird, but if you sort of have like an idea of the general pattern, you should be okay. So radial nerve will be like the dorsum of the hand, medial nerve will be doing like the thenar eminence side, and then ulnar nerve will be doing the hypothenar, em em hypothenar eminence. And you've also got the motor function, which you can sort of raise it just by thinking about like where it runs and what muscles it supplies. So yeah. Um, just a little handy chart to summarize what happens in the hand with each nerve. Okay, fractures. So we've got a number of fractures that you should probably be aware of. So you've got the clavicle fracture. So it's most commonly at the lateral third of the clavicle. So if you imagine the clavicle in like, haha, oh, handy chart. <laughs> if you imagine the clavicle in three, in three thirds, um, the junction between the most lateral third and the middle third is where the fracture most commonly happens. And because you've got a bunch of stuff running under the clavicle between the clavicle and the first rib, um, if you damage that clavicle, it could impact like the, those structures. So that would be like the subclavian artery or vein. And this is possibly caused by like a Fouche injury. So that's just the fall and outstretched hand. Okay, you've also got scapular fractures, which are pretty rare because of just like where they are, I guess, and like what, the, like what they're related to. And this may be caused by high energy trauma. So you need something intense to fracture that. And the scapular, I think one of the, yeah, so the suprascapular nerve runs through like a notch or something of the sort in the scapula. Um, and if you like fractured your scapula, you could injure that. And that's one of the nerves needed for abduction and external rotation. Okay, humerus fractures. So these are like the two important ones you probably should know about and like what lies in relation to them. So if you have a surgical fracture, as we talked about before, you would affect the axillary nerve just because it wraps around the humerus in that region. And something else that accompanies that is the circumflex artery. So if, yeah, so you just think about the nerve and artery that go in the same place. Um, so then you have your mid shaft fracture, which is just like along the humerus, like <laughs> pretty much anywhere. But because the radial groove runs the whole way through the humerus, um, damage to the mid shaft region can damage your radial nerve and can also damage your deep brachial artery, which also runs in that groove. So if they're asking about like what would be damaged, like these two things you should be on the lookout for. Okay. Oh, these are terrible to learn. Do not recommend, but I think you're expected to know them. So Collie's fracture is the dinner fork deformity one. It's basically when you fall with your wrist, wrist in extension and your, your radius close to the hand region, um, the, the distal radial fragment, because it's fractured, the distal radial fragment moves, moves dorsally and gives you this like weird dinner fork appearance. I don't really see it that much, but yeah, it's just called the dinner fork deformity. Um, you've also got the Montegia fracture, which is a fracture of the ulnar bone and you dislocate your radius. These are genuinely like impossible to remember. Just make some flashcards and like drill them, drill the hell out of them, because there's like no easy way to figure out what they are. Um, Galeazzi fracture is a dis fracture of the distal part of the radius with your dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. So I think there's a photo here that kind of shows what happens. And then you've got your Smith's fracture, which results from falling with the wrist flexion. So it's kind of weird. The Smith one's kind of weird because you don't really think about like following with the wrist inflection. Like it's fair that you would follow with your wrist in extension because you're trying to break your fall and you have your hand out in front of you. But the flexion one is like, what? <laughs> Why? Okay, um, so that leads to fracture of distal radius with the distal radial fragment 
um, moving in different directions. That's kind of like similar in a way to the Collie structure, except for the Collie structure has the fragment just moving dorsally. I think that the Collie structure is probably the most important one, just because a foolish injury is one of the more common injuries you can sustain. So if you're going to learn anything, probably learn the Collie structure. Okay, scaphoid fracture. Um, they love to come back to the scaphoid just because it's like in a really convenient position to get fractured. So it's most frequently fractured and that's like by again by a foosh just don't don't foosh um and there's a risk of avascular necrosis as a result of like how the scaphoid is supplied so if you like broke it in the middle then you would end up with like half of it not having any blood supply so then it would die and that would be really bad and then you've got the hamate fracture so this is something that we sort of talked about before as well in terms of the ulnar nerve so the ulnar nerve runs really close to the hook of hamate so damage to this nerve um as a result of like this bone being fractured could lead to decreased grip strength as a result of like the ulnar nerve being damaged. Um, but, so this was taken, so most of these pathologies are taken from Moore and Dally's. Like not, we haven't put all of them in because there's quite a few of them and not all of them are that relevant. But this one was in Moore and Dally's, so we've just included it, but it's not that clinically significant, I wouldn't say. It's basically just your metacarpals are closely bounded because they're like in your hand and they're pretty stable. And you've got your distant phalanx, distal phalanx, which, um, yeah, because they're like super close to the outside. I, I suppose it's not good if you injured those because um, they have pretty close relations to like the, all the tendons running alongside, allowing your fingers to do the finger things. Okay, dislocations. So shoulder dislocations, these usually dislocate anteriorly. So your humerus would move forward just because of like the way the ligaments are structured around like the glenohumeral joint. Um, and if you recall, the axillary nerve like runs in that like surgical neck region. So if you like yate your humerus forward, then that could potentially have impacts on like the axillary nerve and you would have lots of sensation in that regimental patch region. So you can kind of see how everything starts to tie together. If you know where something runs and know what it innervates, um, you can think about like what happens when this damage occurs. Okay, but another one, which is like dislocation of the radial head. So this happens to children. Um, because they have like, I suppose, soft ligaments. <laughs> um, so they, it happens when children are pulled by the arm. So you, so you can kind of see it. If the kid's being yanked upwards by like the parent or like the nursemaid, um, you can slip the radius out of the ligament that holds it there. And that is uh, not great because the child is like, oh shit, my ligaments. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Okay, inflammation. Right, so... There are three types of inflammation. Two of them are related to the epicondyles. One of them is just related to like the bursa of your elbow. Um, first one I'm gonna go through is tennis elbow. So this one is lateral epicondylitis. So this results from overuse of like the extensors and that those attached to your lateral epicondyle. So you would have inflammation there. Um, these symptoms are basically just that you can't, because, you're, because that's inflamed, you're gonna have tenderness at that la like lateral outer region. And you'd also have weak wrist extension because of like the relationship of the extensors to the to this epicondyle and if you think about like the structure of the arm as well it sort of makes sense that the extensors would attach to the to the outside because if you like turn your arm like just it, yeah if you just like feel your arm it sort of it just yeah it, it'd be like that um so golfer's elbow is medial epicondylitis so this one is similar to the tennis except for that it affects the medial side which is where the flexors of the forearm connect so then you'd have tenderness on the inner side as opposed to the outer, and you would have weak wrist flexion because your flexors are attached and that's now like inflamed. Okay, so student's elbow is like the, is like inflammation of like the bursa at your elbow, um, supporting like the lecrinin, which is like that pointy bit at your elbow. Um, and it's most commonly caused by repeated pressure over time. So if you're like, it's, I think that's why they call it student's elbow. It's just cause you're like, but like leaning on your arm and you're like riding or yeah. The grind don't stop. Um, it's worth noting that although they're called like tennis golfers, it's usually not like a tennis player or like a golfer. It's just some random person that comes in. They're like, oh, my arm hurts. And it's they've got like lateral epicondylitis, just from like repeated movement of some sort. Yeah, okay. Other injuries, we're almost there. So thoracic outlet syndrome. So I think these are the ones that did come up on our exam. So, um, but they don't really go in any category. So we'll just put them here. Um, thoracic outlet syndrome is basically when, so you so we sort of mentioned this before as well, you've got that collarbone in your first rib and you've got a lot of structures running through that. So if you were to like compress that region, 
you would end up with a bunch of effects because it's you're affecting like the brachial plexus quite high up and you've also perhaps will be affecting like the vasculature that goes through there and you'd have just like a like a bunch of like vague effects just stuff is painful stuff is numb okay um and they've got winging of the scapula so this is pretty important they like to talk about this um so per, so the serratus anterior is a muscle that like kind of sticks your scapula to your rib and it's innervated by the long thoracic nerve which comes off fairly if you look at the i don't know if you guys have looked at the brachial plexus like roadmap in detail but it comes off like the trunk region so if you injured the long thoracic nerve at from for whatever reason um you would then para paralyze the serratus anterior and then it would no longer be able to stick like your scapula to your ribcage so then it would kind of come up with like a wing shape because it's like no longer stuck there and you can really see this when the person like leans on their hand or like they press so they have like their arm against the wall and like the, the scapula just like pops out it's kind of it's real it's real nasty um but i think we were examined on like how do you best see it and there's there i think there is a word for like when you do that but yeah it's just it just makes it really clear that they have winging when, when they do that movement. Um, and the rotator cuff injury is probably one of the first things you, you learn. Um, and when you have an injury to this, you have instability of your glenohumeral humeral joint. And out of like the four muscles that make up the rotator cuff, you're going to most likely injure the supraspinatus just because of where it is. Okay, and the clearly lymph node dissection, there are so many lymph nodes to learn. Um, so we've just kind of taken what's from Warren Daly's here and hopefully that's enough. But we, I remember we had like a really nasty question about um, lymph nodes and like breast cancer, I believe. So yeah, that was not fun, um, but you know, it's, it do be like that. So in terms of nerves at risk, when you are doing like auxiliary lymph nodes, so that's just like in this region, you're doing dissection with the lymph nodes there, you could damage your long thoracic nerve. So again, that's the serratus anterior um, innervation and you could lead to like the wing of the scapula. So your scapula just pops off and gross and then you've got thoracodorsal nerve which um innervates the latissimus dorsi and that like goes from the back and attaches to like the posterior part of the humerus and then you could get we can adduction to medial rotation of the arm just because of like where it attaches because it's like attaching to like the back of the arm from the from the from the um the actual back um you can kind of imagine it like as it contracts you would pull the arm down and you would also rotate the arm medially because it's like attached to the posterior part of the arm. Hang on. That, yes, that's kind of weird. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, that's it's kind of weird, but I think it does make sense. Um, and so, yeah, that's basically the effect that you get when you damage a thoracodorsal nerve. And I think that's one of the, two, one of the, so these are like the two tiny branches from the brachial plexus that you probably should know. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to say which exactly, like how much detail you need to go into. But if there is a clinical correlation, then most likely, yes, you should know it. Okay, so on some questions, type your answers in the chat. Getting answers. <laughs> Oh shit, she's awake. She lives. Yeah, look, slipping a banana peel would be Isabel. Okay, teres minor. <laughs> yep, you guys are right. So auxiliary nerve innervates the deltoid and teres minor, and auxiliary nerve is keyword surgical neck of the humerus. This is funky hand stuff that you should know. <laughs> Nice. Okay. So the median nerve does like the tips of those fingers and also does like all of like this front bit. And then the radial nerve is responsible for like the back section of those fingers, but only after like the second joint. Okay. Any more answers? Got one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> We're gonna go through it. Okay, yeah, that was right. C. Um, 
essentially it's just intertubecular groove, long head of the biceps runs through that groove. And the, so that would be, um, yeah, so that would indicate it's long head thing. And the abnormal bulge would indicate it's a, it's a rupture of the, of the muscle tendon. <laughs> okay. You got the answers? Okay. Perfect. Love it. B. Yeah. So this is, I think this is supposed to be, yeah, this is a Collis fracture and it results from that Fouch injury. Um, so then you've got your radius being fractured distally and your distal radial fragment moves dorsally and you have that dinophoric appearance. All right, that's it from me. I will stop sharing. Uh, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just also a bit of a heads up. Okay, my internet has been doing weird stuff, so if I cut out, like, yeah, big rip. Um, okay, but yeah, we should be good to go. All right, so basically I'll be taking you through sensory systems. Um, this is going to link to a bit of the muscle things that you guys would have learned last week. And a lot of this is basically to do with sensory receptors. So starting off, first of all, differentiating between sensation and perception. So basically sensation is just being aware of this, uh, kind of just realizing there is a stimuli. Perception is actually being aware of it. So we've got um, a kind of image over here. Everything in yellow is to do with the actual sensation. Everything in uh, orange is going to be to do with your perception. So how this process generally works is, first of all, you get some kind of a stimuli happening and then this stimuli is going to be acting on your sensory receptors. After that, then your sensory receptors say, okay, something's happening. So then they send all these neural signals up to the cerebral cortex. So cerebral cortex pretty much is just your brain or like the big brain area. Um, and that's pretty much what causes you to perceive what's happening. So in terms of stimuli, we've got two types. So we've got your distal stimuli and your proximal stimuli. So distal just means far away. So if there's like, I guess, a car's alarm that's like going off in the distance, that would be considered your distal stimuli versus your proximal stimuli, which is directly the energy that's stimulating your receptors. So an example of this would be your phone, which would be your distal stimuli versus light waves, which would be considered your proximal. Um, same thing, music versus sound waves, one's distal, one's proximal. So this is just a bit of a quick exercise for you guys. So these are a bunch of different receptors and these receptors are all going to have different functions. So depending on the functions, see if you guys can guess the location. So we'll start off with the first one. So photoreceptors, photoreceptors are going to detect your light. So where do you think this might be found? And feel free to either unmute or just type in the chat. Or if you want to send a um, private message, that's fine as well. Yeah, really good, the eye. So that's responsible for your vision. Next, we've got chemoreceptors, which detect the presence of chemicals. So taking a bit of a guess, what areas in the body might require you to be able to sense chemicals? Yeah, that's really, really good. The nose, there's actually one more. Other one would be tongue. So the smell and taste, you need to detect chemicals. So mechanoreceptors, these detect your mechanical forces. So where do you think that might be? There's actually two for this one, but um, so, okay, um, basically it's going to either be on your skin or it's going to be from hearing things which occurs in your ears. And the reasoning for that is the way we hear things, it's not because of like any chemicals, but rather you have lots of small hairs in your ears. And what they essentially do is when the sound waves comes and stimulates these like cilia or hair in your ears, that causes them to move. And that's why we have different frequencies for sounds. And you can tell like the difference in sound, I guess. So proprioceptors, where do you think this might be located?
Come on, guys. Just give me a couple of guesses. Doesn't matter if you're wrong. Yes, very close, but oh, wait, actually, yeah, yes, this is one of them. Yeah, good job. So you've got proprioception um, occurring in the inner ear, and that's to do with the fluid in your ear that gives you balance. And you've also got proprioceptors in your muscles and joints as well, which helps determine like where exactly your arm is. So even if you have your eyes closed and you have your arm in an outstretched position, you can kind of tell where about it is. So thermoreceptors detects changes in your temperature. Where do you think that might be? In. Yeah, really good. And last one, nociceptors. So these ones are going to detect damage or threat to your damage or threat of damage to your body tissues and basically are responsible for sensing pain. Um, I don't know if that skin was referring to thermoreceptors, but yeah, it's also the case for nociceptors as well. So these are going to be found in your skin. So as you can kind of remember from before, we've got stimuli coming in and basically stimulating your sensory receptors, which go on to send neural signals to the brain. But how does the brain tell what kind of signal this is? So it does this via four different methods, I guess. So first, it looks at the modality, aka what type of stimulus this is. And the brain can differentiate between the types of stimuli depending on where they come from. So basically, it's written here, if you've got information coming from the optic nerve or somewhere in your eye, then your brain is going to say, okay, this is going to be perceived as light versus uh, I guess if it's coming from someone on your leg, you don't want your brain to be confusing that with like taste or something because obviously you don't taste from your leg. That would be considered a motor um, action. So second is location. Location, it's more or less, first of all, talking about where your stimulus is coming from. And second, how accurate um, is, how accurately can your body pinpoint um, where this particular stimulus is from? So that's achieved via your different receptive fields. If you've got a really small receptive field, you're going to be super accurate versus if you've got a larger one, it's going to be less accurate. And it might have been covered in your lecture, but one thing you can do, you can get like two pen tips or something and then try this on a family or friend. Um, and essentially you get them to close their eyes and place both of these pen tips like on their, the back of their hand or something. And basically get them to guess whether you're using one pen or like two pens. And you'll see that the accuracy is going to increase in areas such as like your fingertips versus somewhere like your thigh. And that's because the receptive fields on your fingertip are a lot smaller than the ones on your thigh. Hence, you're going to be able to pinpoint whether it's like one or two pencil tips like on your finger better than that on your thigh. So with regards to intensity, we look at three different aspects. So first, how many fibers are firing? Oh, sorry, that's the second one. So first of all, how frequently is it firing? Second, how many are firing? And third, what type of fibers are firing? So if you have non-sensitive fibers firing super quickly and a lot of them firing at the same time, then you're assuming it's going to be a very intense stimuli because the non-sensitive ones are firing versus the, the sensitive ones that would just mean like a little bit of stimuli, they're going to go off. Last one, we're going to talk about duration and changes. So phasic versus tonic fibers. Phasic fibers, they adapt really quickly and tonic fibers, they adapt slowly. So if your tonic fibers are firing, that tells us that the duration is super long. So um, examples of tonic fibers might be like your muscle, um, like your back muscles or something. Phasic fibers pretty much tell you if there's been a sudden change in your environment. So if the phasic one has gone off, you know that there's been a sudden change. If the tonic one's going off, then it's basically a chronic thing or it's been going on for a while. So a couple of diagrams to do with this. So this is talking about the distance between your tonic and phasic. You can see this stimulus is starting off from here and ending, I guess, at the end. For your tonic fibers, it's going to slowly adapt versus your phasic, which has a sudden um, action potential and then kind of like adapts quite quickly. The thing on the right is something that we call like the sensory homunculus, which there's another image on the next slide. But the, I guess, the amount or the area in the brain that's, kind of related to the body part will tell you how accurate the, um, or like how good the sensation is. So as you can see, there's a large pro portion of the brain that's dedicated to the hand and the finger region. And that basically means that the sensation in your fingers is going to be a lot better than the sensation in your like hip or leg, because there's only this section that's dedicated to the hip and leg versus all of this dedicated to your hand. Um, another fun fact that we were told by the upper PSDs was like, 
the reason that some people get fetishes is basically because it, the foot, the area that's like dedicated to the feet and the toes is like super close to the genitals. So that might be a potential reason why. Um, yep, that's the image of the sensory homunculus. And it's pretty much like a model of what we were talking about before. So um, if you guys have any questions regarding that, chuck them in the chat. Otherwise we might move on to neural integration. So neural integration is talking about how does the brain basically tell your muscles how to move. So first of all, introducing the brain. So um, here's just like a bit of terminology. The main things that we are going to focus on today is your cerebral cortex, which is all of this area and your cerebellum, which is pretty much like the, the mini brain or the little brain that sits at the back of the cerebral cortex. So first looking at the cerebral cortex, the, I guess the main players that you have to know about, this is the basal ganglia and it consists of five paired structures. So first we've got your globus pallidus, which is um, these two sections in here. So you've got the globus pallidus externus out there and then the internus or like internal inside. Next, you've got your striatum, which consists of your caudate nucleus, which is up here, and the putamen, which is basically on the side. Then you've got your subthalamic nucleus, which is this purple bit here, and your substantial nigra, which happens if you cut um, horizontally across the brain here, that's just going to be situated on the side. So how, are, okay, so the question remains is like, how does, wait, am I missing slides? Uh, give me one moment. Okay, okay, that's all good. Um, so next question is, how does your brain generate movement essentially? So when you think about walking in general, right? If you're moving your right leg, your left leg is like, like it's still. So you don't want your legs to be moving at the same time because otherwise you're going to like cause accidents. You're not going to be able to walk properly. So the brain actually does this via a very like uh, smart method, I guess. So it's, there's like a direct pathway and an indirect pathway. The direct pathway will tell your leg to move and at the same time, there's an indirect pathway which will prevent your left leg from moving whilst your right leg is moving. So first about the direct pathway, this is what generates the movement itself. And a bit of context, so just remember, the thalamus is always in its active state and always wants to send excitatory projections. So VLO literally just stands for like your thalamus. I think I've written the seeker notes like, oh no, I haven't. Oh wait. Yes, okay, it stands for the oral part of the ventral lateral nucleus. Don't worry too much about that. Just know that this is your thalamus. So what happens when you want to generate movement? Your cortex, your big brain, sends excitatory projections to your striatum. And then striatum is going to then send inhibitory um, projections to the um, internus, or globus pallidus internus. And since your globus pallidus internus is usually responsible for inhibiting your thalamus, the inhibition of this structure is going to cause this whole entire thing to essentially cancel out. So what you eventually get is your inhibition of your thalamus is now cancelled, which allows your thalamus to then send excitatory projections to the motor cortex, and then you can have your voluntary movement. Um, just another side thing, I guess, inhibitory neurotransmitters are your GABA, and the excitatory ones are glutamate. Don't need to know too much about it, but if you hear those two terms, they're just neurotransmitters that do different things. In terms of your indirect pathway, so once again, pretty much the same thing, but instead this time your striatum, instead of projecting to your globus pallidus internus, goes by a different route to the globus pallidus externus. So if we start from the start, so you've got your cortex sending um, excitatory projections to your striatum, that then is going to send inhibition to your globus pallidus internus. And since this structure is normally responsible for inhibiting um, the subthalamic nucleus, that's essentially going to cancel out and hence leave the subthalamic nucleus free to send like excitatory projections to the globus pallidus internus. If this structure is then free to like, free to operate, I guess, that's going to then inhibit your um, thalamus. And if your thalamus is inhibited, then it can't send anything to your cortex. So what you end up with is like your voluntary movement is then inhibited and hence you can't move. So specifically about your cerebral cortex, um, before it was like generating movement, this is talking about like how that actually plays out. So first of all, just in general about your cerebral cortex, you've got different lobes. Different lobes are responsible for different things. So the one that we're going to focus on primarily, it's like these three out the front. This one, I guess we can talk a little bit about it, but not too important. So the blue structure here is your primary motor cortex. Primary motor is like 
primarily responsible for the motor actions. Then you've got your, um, this one's your supplementary motor cortex over here and the premotor cortex over here. These two are responsible for generating a blueprint. So what happens is your premotor area, it basically controls the proximal and trunk muscles versus your supplementary, which is more learning the sequence of contraction. So an example of this might be if you were to go and pick up, I guess, a glass of water that was sitting on the table. So your premotor area would tell your body like how to, how do I move the trunk muscles and also like your arm muscles to kind of place yourself in a position to grab this particular glass of water. Supplementary area would plan out what do I need to do to my fingers to like, I guess, extend your fingers, grab hold of it and then like contract your fingers. And then the primary motor cortex would then be responsible for actually um, executing these actions. Um, just like a side note, posterior parietal cortex, all that does is like, um, it pretty much links your visual information with the motor. So as you're moving your arm towards this glass of water, it can tell you, oh, you're moving the arm too much to the right, too much to the left, and pretty much change up the sequence of actions depending on like the input that it's getting back. So um, that's pretty much it for the cerebral cortex. Last little structure is your cerebellum. So that's the one that's sitting at the base of your brain. And what this does, it, it fine tunes like the small movements. So if we go back to the example of picking up a glass of water, your cerebral cortex is responsible for major actions. Cerebellum tells you how much pressure you need to exert in order to pick it up. If, it's, if there's a problem with the cerebellum, you might be like holding onto the glass too strongly, causing it to shatter or you could be holding onto it too weakly, causing it to fall out. So cerebellum is your fine tuning movements. And as a result, it's responsible for like um, small things, I guess, like learning an instrument or like dancing. So also coordination, timing and balance is also part of the role of the cerebellum. In terms of its structure, you don't need to know too much about this, but it's in the slides for completion. So in terms of lobes, you've got your anterior, your posterior, and the one on the bottom called your flocular, flocular, nodular lobe. Um, yep, and then we can also categorize it in terms of zones. So you've got your vermis zone, which is um, in the middle over here. This controls your trunk. So if you think middle trunk, that kind of makes sense. Intermediate zone is the one on the side. So this controls the distal portion of your limbs, a little bit aside from the trunk, distal portion of limbs makes sense as well. Lateral zone, this is timing coordination or sequential movement. Um, I guess a way of remembering it is like, Timing and coordination, I always thought of like playing an instrument. You need to like control that quite well. So lateral zone, that's like lateral from the intermediate. If intermediate controls like the distant, distal portion of the limbs, this could be like controlling your fingers, which is like important for timing and coordination. Um, once again, these ones don't need to know too much either, but just know vestibular cerebellum is like your balance and posture stuff. So that's on the top and bottom here. Spinocerebellum is this yellow bit colored in here. That's for your training coordination. And cerebral cerebella is like timing, rotor planning, learning, and memory. You don't need to know too much about it, but if you do want to, um, unless you're planning on like going to neurology or something, um, but a good way of remembering, I guess, is like spinocerebellum is like to do with your spine. So important in terms of like turn and coordination. Cerebro is like to do with brain stuff. So you're thinking like learning, memory stuff. Okay, so a few questions to kind of consolidate knowledge. Which of the following two are considered to be proximal stimuli? Almost. Um, I'll say oh, proximal stimuli. Um, other way, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, A and D is correct. B and C would be considered distal, yes. So. What do nociceptors do? See, really good. So the other ones, chemicals, chemoreceptors, positioning is proprio, and then mechanical forces, mechano. So which of the following is incorrect? So impulses arriving from chemoreceptors will be interpreted as smell or taste. A larger receptive field corresponds to greater sensitivity and accuracy. The firing of non-sensitive fibers suggests that the stimuli is intense, and tonic fibers are often observed to be firing in a chronic pathology. Yeah, really good. So larger receptive field, decreased accuracy. 
So what part of the cerebral cortex is responsible for carrying out motor movements? Yep, yeah, really good. D, the other three are more for like your plan. So, sorry, these two are your planning ones. This one's like visual translation to motor. Um, what is the function of the cerebellum? Good. So cerebellum, remember, it's the fine tuning movements, such as if you're picking up a glass of water, how much, I guess, uh, what's that word? Like how much um, strength do you need to put into that? Okay, and what are the, uh, which of the following isn't a lobe of the cerebellum? Yeah, nice, intermediate, so we've got our anterior, posterior, and then Cooler nuclear. Um, yep, so that's all we have for neural integration. So I'll hand over to Malika now. Okay, so I'll just be going through the Quinskill exam for MSK. And okay, so intro um, pretty much like normal for taking a history, just add a couple of things. So hand hygiene, introducing yourself, and then explain the exam. So you always include exposure and just say what the exam involves. And then consent, confidentiality, patient details, and always make sure to ask if the patient's in any pain or discomfort, then uh, ask them to let you know if that changes throughout the exam. So you can stop if something's hurting too much. Um, yeah. And then for MSK, you position the patient. If you're starting with shoulder, you have them standing up with the upper half of their body exposed. Okay, so I'm not going to go through everything in detail, so I'll probably just let you read through the slides later because it'll basically be the exact same thing you've gone through in class. So I'll try to go through more of the tests and movements rather than all the inspection and everything. Okay, so yeah, inspection for shoulder, it's really important to look at the muscle bulk in particular, and then the rest is pretty much same as normal. And comparing both sides is also really important. And then for palpation, um, yeah, same thing as normal. So temperature, swelling, and then go through all your landmarks. And I've just got a description for where to find each landmark. Okay, so for movements, you have to do active then passive. So active, you do both at the same time and you compare both sides. And I find that in an actual exam, the easiest way to do it is you can just say, okay, I'm just going to do some movements. Can you please copy me? So then you can do them and then it's easier for them to understand rather than you trying to explain what they can do especially because it's time, like it's time. So you need to be quick. And then passive, you do one side at a time and you compare and you're checking for crepitus. Okay, so in terms of the movements, so you start with shoulder flexion, which is, um, okay, I don't know if you can see my camera, but it's basically just arm straight up, 180 degrees, extension arm back. So that's like 65 degrees. And then abduction is active 180. Or if you're doing it passively, you do it with the arm bent and then you just do it up to here, so 90 degrees. Then adduction across is 50 degrees. External rotation is 65. And internal rotation is the one behind your back where it's just 90 degrees. Okay, so in terms of special tests for shoulder, um, it's important because uh, you guys won't be doing OSCEs or CSSEs or anything uh, the semester. So, but on the exam, they do like to test you in terms of, oh, this patient came in and they did this test. What is this test testing for? Or the patient came in with this sort of, um, uh, and you need a test for this. What test would you do? So you need to know what everything's testing for. So Hawkins and near sign are for both for impingement of subacromial space. So, okay, I can't really demonstrate Hawkins without another person. For near sign, you have them medially rotate their arm. So you just turn it inward so that the thumb is facing back and then you just move it up pretty much. And they're both passive tests. And then painful arc is for your rotator cuff legion. So you basically just get them to do abduction. And if there's pain in the 60 to 120 degree um, angle, then that suggests that there is a rotator cuff legion. So supraspinatus tendonitis, 
is the main cause to get a positive sign there. For your apprehension test, that's checking for glenohumeral instability. And so the patient has their arm at 90 degrees and you're basically trying to like push their arm. Um, but yeah, don't push too hard. Okay, so you've got four resisted movements for upper limb. So you have to, there's a lot of names to remember. And I find even though you don't need to know how to do them, exam, uh, the actual tests yet, like it doesn't really matter too much because you're not being tested on it. I find it's useful if you know how to do it to remember the names and what they're testing for, especially because MSK, it's all about muscles and movement. So if you know how to do the movements, it's easier. So supraspinatus, you um, basically get them to bring their arms out in front of them. And then you have to turn your hand over like you're pouring out a can of Coke or something. That's why it's called the empty can test. And then you test for abduction. So you're just pushing down on their arm. So that's why that one's called that. For subscapularis, that's also called the lift off test because that's in testing internal rotation because the hand's behind the back and they're trying to lift their hand away from the back. So that's why it's called lift off or Gerber's test. And then infraspinatus and teres minor is just external rotation and biceps is just elbow flexion. And then aptly scratch test is an overall test for shoulder movement and stability. So you do this on both sides. So you're basically trying to touch the opposite shoulder. So you touch it from the front, from the back and from behind. And then you do it with your left hand as well. So from the front, from the back and behind. And uh, okay, so when they te teach it to you in clean skills, they generally get you to do that one last. Um, not that the order really matters too much, but in real life, that's just a good way to test, first of all, to see where there could be a problem. Okay, so for elbow. Um, for inspection, the main thing to focus on is like the rheumatoid nodules or the enlarged bursa. They're the two main ones um, that are different for inspection for elbow. Okay, so palpation, you, uh, yeah, you've basically just got your three bumps to check for. And they're all important here because you've got the olecranon, which is for olecranon bursitis, which is student's elbow. Then you've got medial epicondyle, so medial epicondylitis or uh, golfer's elbow. And then lateral epicondyle, which is lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Okay, so elbow flexion, you basically just do this. So that's 150 degrees from there. Extension is zero. Uh, supination is like soup, so 90 degrees. Um, pronation is like piano, so 90 degrees as well. And yeah, so you have two special tests. So the way you can remember it is your, okay, you have to think about the muscles in your forearm. So your anterior compartment has your flexors and those originate from the medial epicondyle. And if you imagine doing a golf swing, your wrist is flexing. So that's why it's called golfer's elbow. For lateral epicondylitis, you think about the posterior compartment because that's where you have your extenders, extensors, and they originate from your lateral epicondyle. That's why you do resisted extension for lateral epicondylitis. And it's tennis elbow because you imagine doing a backhand in tennis, and that does wrist extension. So when you test it, you basically get them to put their hands out front, and for golfer's elbow, they'll flex. Then you can push down and do one hand at a time because you don't want them to fall over. And then lateral, you do the same but opposite. So I guess it's like riding a motorbike kind of. So you have them extend, and then you push down. Okay, so for wrist, you check for ganglion cysts and ulnar deviation, which can be in rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, and then radial deviation. Uh, okay, so for landmarks, you've got the uh, regular few, so ulnar, radial, and then listers, and then you've got all your carpal bones. So you can remember your carpal bones with the um, mnemonic straight line to pinky, here comes the thumb. And so to run through them, so on the back of your hand, if you extend your thumb, you can get, see your anatomical snuff box. So you have your scaphoid, which is distal. 
And then you have your trapezium, which is distal to your scaphoid. So scaphoids at the bottom, then trapeziums further away. And then you find your second metacarpal and you follow that down and there's a little dip. That's where your trapezoid is. The third metacarpal, same thing, follow it down, there's a dip. Um, the one that's more proximal, that's your lunate, that's on one side of the dip. On the other side, that's more distal, that's your capitate. And so that's the five on the back of your hand. Then on the front of your hand, uh, you have your triquetrum, which is just distal to your ulnar styloid. You got your pisiform, which is on the side. And then you have your hook of hamate right in the middle of your hypo, oh, sorry, it's on the side. Um, so you got your triquetrum here, you've got your pisiform here, and then you've got your hook of hamate, which is in the center of your hypothena eminence. And it doesn't matter too much if you can't actually feel, because there's a lot of bony structures around there. But um, basically when you're feeling over the bones, if you feel for tenderness or something, um, if there is tenderness present, then there might be a fracture or something, which you can look further into. Okay, so movements of your wrist. You've got flexion, which is 90. Then you've got extension, which is 70. You've got ulnar deviation, so pinky side, so that's 55, and radial deviation is 20. So two special tests, so carpal tunnel, for carpal tunnel syndrome. So Phelan's test and Tinnel sign. So Phelan's test is the reverse prayer sign and you just keep it like that for a minute. And then if there's any sensory symptoms like tingling or numbness. So, cause your carpal tunnels here, if you hold it like that, then you're basically um, forcing it to bend. So then uh, that can irritate the median nerve if there's an issue there. And then tunnel sign, you're basically tapping over where the median nerve runs through the carpal tunnel. Okay, so for your fingers, you can get these Bouchard's nodes and Habedin's nodes. So both of them are seen in osteo, but Bouchard's can be seen in rheumatoid as well. You generally don't get Habedin's in rheumatoid. So that's basically a picture of what they look like. And then you also look for muscle wasting. So if you look at which, like if there is muscle wasting present, if you look at which group of muscles, you can get an idea as to which nerve. So your thena eminence is innervated by your median nerve, hypothena eminence by your ulnar nerve, and your interosseous muscles by your ulnar nerve. Okay, so there's quite a few deformities related to arthritis. So a lot of it's for rheumatoid. So you can have your swan neck, which is your one over here, your boutonniere, and then your Z deformity, which is for the thumb. And then you can have ulnar deviation of your MCP joints. You can also have sausage shaped fingers in psoriatic arthropathy and mallet finger, which is a fixed flexion deformity of DIP. So that basically means um, you can straighten it passively, but if, there's, like, if you're not touching that hand at all, your finger's gonna automatically go into flexion because something's broken here, so you can't, um, extend it uh, actively anymore. And then for your fingernails, you can also get pitting nails and psoriasis. Um, yeah, so your landmarks basically just your joints and your metacarpal heads. Okay, so there's a lot of finger movements. So you can have flexion, which is just at your MCP joints, which is 90, extension, which is 30, abduction and adduction. And then your thumb has a lot of movements on its own. So your thumbs, if you look at, if you look at your hand, your thumbs in a different plane, it's like 90 degrees to the rest of your fingers. That's why finger flexions this way, but thumb flexions this way. So thumb flexion is like that, extensions like that, abductions away from the hand, adductions towards the hand, and then oppositions just touch the pinky, make a ring. And then, those are most of your joints. The last two you have left are PIP and DIP. So you test flexion at both of those. The problem with PIP and DIP, well, it's not a problem, but it's just something extra you have to do, is you have to hold the patient's fingers down. So for PIP, you have to hold the, the rest of the patient's fingers down. So um, if this was on a table, you'd like hold the rest of the fingers down and then get them to flex that one finger. Then you'd go through them all pretty much like that. And then, um, yeah, you go through all eight fingers for that. For your DIP, you actually hold down the finger that you're testing. So you hold this down and then you get them to flex just the end. 
um, and then you go through all eight for that. So there's resisted movements as well. So you do thumb up adduction. So you have them try and push their thumb away from their hand. Then you can do finger flexion at your MCP joints, but you can do the MCP joints all at once. For your PIP and DIP, you do the exact same thing as you did before. So if you're doing this, you'd like um, hold them all down, but you'd also use your other hands to keep a finger on there to put some resistance. Um, yeah, so using both hands in this case. And DIP, same thing as before. So you keep one hand here to stop the other joints from moving. And then you put the other finger here to add some resistance. And your special tests for fingers is pretty much anything you can do um, that will test your hand function. So you can test grip strength, which is just squeeze your fingers as tight as you can. So that tests their flexes. You can do the key grip. Um, so you're basically just holding something in your hand and then they have to pull it out. So that tests your adductor pollicis. And then you've got a practical test. So like writing your name. So that's like equivalent to the Apley's test in your shoulder. So it's just an overall hand function test. Then you've got your opposition strength. So you make a ring and then you pull up and you get them to stop you breaking. They have to try to stop the ring from breaking. So that tests you to opponent's muscles. And then you could have them undo some buttons. So that's also just an overall test of hand function. Okay, so that's it for the exam. Then the ending, just thank the patient, ask them to put their clothes back on and hand hygiene. Cool, so I've got a couple of questions for you guys. So just write your answers in the chat. So what's the test for resisted shoulder abduction? So if you remember how to do the test, you have to have your hands out, like you're pouring out your can of Coke or something. So empty can test. So which of the following matches up correctly with your epicondylitis, what the other name is and the movement. So remember lateral epicondylitis is your posterior compartment, so your extensors, which originate from your lateral epicondyle, and it's like doing a backhand in tennis. So and then medial is the opposite. Medial epicondyle, anterior compartment, flexes, uh, doing a swing, a golf swing. Okay, last question. Um, what are some tests for assessing your hands and fingers? So like the special tests. You don't need to name them all, by the way. Just give me um, one or two if you remember any. Yep. 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 Okay, those are all good. And then, yeah, so just add in the key grip and then that's everything. Okay, that's it for today, guys. Um, thanks for coming. And if you've got any questions, feel free to stay behind and ask and write in the chat or unmute. And we'll see you next week.